Hi, everyone. We're currently in room three with our next session commencing shortly. I hope your first session this morning went really well. The session coming up is patterns, what to do if you believe in them, what to do if you don't. And the presenter is James Tanton coming live from Arizona. I just sat in on James's keynote and let me assure you you're in for a real treat. We'll commence at 10.25 in just a couple of minutes. Thanks everyone. Well, good day, everyone. Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. It's the afternoon here. I'm about to have my dinner soon after this fabulous presentation. Well, we'll see if it's fabulous. You're all the judges of that. But it's an honor to be here, and I hope all is going swimmingly well back in my homeland of Australia. I've been living in the US for the last 32 years. I came here and got my PhD and kind of stayed. Um, but I grew up in Adelaide, Australia, and did all my schooling there, K through 12, and then uh, undergraduate work, and came and got my PhD over here. So my heart is with you guys in Australia. I hope all is grand back in my homeland and I hear fabulous things are happening on the maths front because MAB 20 is happening right now and it is truly fabulous. So you're here for patterns, what to do if you believe in them, what to do if you don't. And you're probably wondering why on your screen there's a tomato and a rock. Because um, actually, let me start with this strange way. So um, I think you can see both me and the screen. So if I hold them up here, Here's a rock, it's pretty heavy, it's from my backyard. Here's a tomato, not so heavy, not from my backyard. It came from the grocery grocery store, grocery shops, shops. I came from the shops, I get my, my Aussie lingo back. Um, so this is definitely lighter than this. This is definitely heavier, heavier, heavier than the tomato. And many decades ago, centuries ago, millennia ago, people used to think that if I drop these things at the same time, boom, the heavier one is gonna fall through the air faster than the lighter one. The rock will hit the ground, maybe imperceptibly slightly shorter time than the, the, the tomato. Now, it's so fast that often people couldn't tell the difference, but people believe that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects through the air. Now, there's also air resistance and so forth. People have theories about how air resistance might change that theory a little bit, but people honestly thought that heavier objects fall through the air faster than lighter objects. But Aristotle wrote a lot about that and had a big theory about how this works. And this fellow in the 1500s, 1600s came along by the name of Galileo and said, hang on, could that be true? Let's think about it. And he did a little thought experiment. He said, imagine there's a very light string that connects this tomato to this rock. So actually then it's technically just one object. One object that's heavier than the rock itself because the weight is the rock plus tomato. And it's also heavier than the tomato because it's tomato plus rock is its weight. So the whole thing, if heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones, the whole thing just suddenly start falling faster than any individual item. And that seemed mighty fishy to Galileo. He said, that can't be right. How does the tomato know that suddenly attached to the rock and should start therefore falling faster than it did before? Ditto for the rock. Something's up with that. So he actually said, I can, I'm gonna do an experiment. Let me actually try to measure the speed of falling objects. Which ones hit the ground first? Heavier ones, lighter ones? Is there any truth to that? And he wrote about, and I'm sure he did not, there's no evidence he actually did this, but he wrote about going up the Leading Tower of Pisa so I'll draw the Leaning Tower of Pisa and I'll go to my, my document camera here. So here's my fabulous drawing of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and going up to the top, dropping things off the edge and timing them as they fall to the ground. Now he knew that was actually too fast. Even you couldn't do a physics experiment they actually do that easy, easily with the um, tools he had. So he actually did do the equivalent of this, but not with falling objects. He actually had objects roll down ramps. They're still in motion because of gravity, but he managed to be able to, the ramps would slow them down. He could actually measure the, the speeds and accelerations they're rolling down ramps. So he did the equivalent of this with ramps, but the idea was about actually, could I imagine doing an experiment of dropping things in the leading tower piece and timing them and collecting data? So if I make up some data, here's the sort of thing he was trying to imagine getting. I'm gonna pretend that this is hundred meters tall. I have no idea how long the, the leading tower piece is. So he's gonna hopefully collect data like this. He'll measure at different times, their heights at different times, the heights in meters and the times in seconds say. Start at 0.0, .0 seconds and then, then maybe every half a second interval, which is probably not true. I'm sure it fa falls down faster than that. I'm completely, completely making up this data. So at the start of the experiment, every object is 100 meters tall. And then maybe if you times an object goes down to 96 meters high, then maybe 84, then 64, then 36 and zero. Something like that hits the ground after 2.5 seconds. Completely made up data. But anyhow, he's hoping to get data something like that because this is what he was hoping to see from the data. He was very careful to make sure the time intervals he measured were constant, constant time intervals. I did half seconds here. So he said, okay, think about it. What's velocity? Velocity is the change in height over change in time. So if I've got constant time interval, constant changes of time, the changes in height he's seeing are a representation of the velocity. 
And look at this, the height of 100 goes down to 96, it's down four meters. 96 to 84 is down 12 meters. 84 to 64 is down 20 meters. 64 to 36 is down, oh golly gee, 28 meters. And then 36 down to zero is down 36 meters. So this, this data, these differences, how far it falls down in the regular time intervals is a representation of velocity. And you say, well, keep going, because acceleration is rate of change of velocity over constant time intervals. So this actually goes from negative four to negative 12, that goes down by eight. Negative 12 to negative 20 goes down by eight. Negative 20 to negative 28 is down by eight. Negative 28 times negative 36 is down by eight. He was seeing constant changes in the second differences. He's seeing constant acceleration. And he saw that no matter what the weight of the object was. Heavier objects, lighter objects, irrespective. He saw the same constant acceleration for all his experiments. Which then he did something amazing. First of all, he proved that actually all objects fall down at the same rate. Air resistance, of course, is gonna affect things, but due to gravity, or the acceleration due to gravity is constant. And he went one step further. He said, oh, from seeing these constant accelerations, I know that the height of the falling object follows a formula like this, uh, a quadratic formula. It's about T squareds and Ts and Cs, because it constant Cs. So the time squared, the time, and some numbers floating around. To which I say, whoa, whoa, where did that come from out of the blue? He went from constant acceleration and immediately said that. This was amazing. What led him to know there's a formula that goes with what he, his work did there? That's kind of what I want to do today. So obviously he was looking at structure in his data and that data led him to a formula. What did Galileo do? How do you see a formula like that? So that's the game I'd like to play today for the next uh, number of minutes, whatever they may be, till 10 past the hour. Here goes, here goes. So let's play the game of patterns. Let's say we just trust patterns. I just got to trust patterns. So if I give you a pattern, here comes a pattern, two, five, eight, 11, 14, 17, say, what's the next number in the sequence? I bet you're all screaming in your minds the same number. And if you want to put it into chat and scream into chat somehow, feel free, because I bet we're all screaming the same number right now. And Nadia, Nadia my, my co-host here, is going to type, tell me what's going on in the chat. What's the next number in that sequence? I bet you're screaming something. And we have a 10 second delay, by the way, so it's going to take a little moment here. So I have to like ramble on a little bit whilst we wait for the delay to catch up. What's the next number? What's the next number? I'm all jittery with excitement. Here's my hand, all jittery. See my jittery hand? <laughs> What's going to be? Nadia, there must be someone oh, by now. They're all saying 20. Of course they're saying 20. Everyone's saying 20, of course. Because everyone's seeing goes up by three, up by three, up by three, up by three, up by three. Therefore, if you believe the pattern, it's going to keep going up by three, must be 20. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, let's play this game again. Two, three, six, 11, uh, 18, 27, 38. If you believe in patterns, what's the next number? And I'm going to do it. Actually, it's up by one, up by three, up by five, up by seven, up by nine, up by 11. I don't see a pattern yet. But maybe I see a pattern of the differences. Up by two, up by two, up by two, up by two, up by two. So even surely I, James Tant, will see this one because I think it's going to have to go up by two next, which means it's probably going to go up by 13 for the next row, which means it's going to go up by 13, probably two. I bet people are writing 51 in the chat. Are they, Nadia? Wow. Yeah, 51. Wow. You're beautiful. And uh, okay, how about this one? 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17, 17. Okay, I'm sorting your intelligence now. Don't bother writing this in the chat because I know you're all thinking 17. Of course you're thinking 17, there's no change. But my point is, my point is, look what we've got. The sort of data I'm throwing at us, this one had constant first differences. I looked at the differences and it's constant right there. This one had constant second differences. I did the first differences. I was pretending I couldn't see a pattern there, but I saw, definitely saw a pattern in the second differences. And this one is already constant to begin with. So you didn't have to bother doing any differences, it was constant. So this constancy going on here is actually kind of handy. In fact, in fact I'll show you, let me reveal something to you. You don't actually need to know all this data to find this structure. All you need to know are the beginning numbers of each line. In fact, if I did the next line here, it would be up by zero, up by zero, up by zero, up by zero. And then another one would be up by zero, up by zero. But I can keep going with more zeros. Because here's a very key observation about these tables I'm doing. Suppose I gave you a sequence, 
but I'm not going to tell you much about it. The first number is two, and I'm not going to tell you anything else. That's it. I want you to tell me what this number is. Whoa, not very exciting. Let me give you some more next information. The first number in the differences is three. I won't tell you anything else. The next number is four. I won't tell you anything else. The next number is zero. I won't tell you anything else. Next number is one. I won't tell you anything else. Next number is three. I won't tell you anything else. Have I given you enough information that you can now tell me what that number is in that sequence? Whoa, now I need to give you time. Now I'm actually making us work. Actually, this might take the full 45 minutes. It's gonna be a very boring workshop. With nothing but tables of arithmetic. Golly gee, why'd you hire this guy? But I will help us out because I can see two is meant to go up by three, so this must be five. So we've got that second number at least. Is there any way I can fill in the rest of this table and get up to there? I want to know what that sixth number is. Is it possible to figure it out? Well, that was technically a yes, no question. So if you type in chat, yes, I would say yes. I'll believe you. People are saying no, James. It's not possible to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> All right, then I'm up for a challenge. Let's do it. Okay, I'll do a bit more because the only thing I can see right here, that three must be going up by four. So I know that must be seven. Oh, then I can see, oh, five must be going up by seven to make that 12. I got to the third number. I bet you can get to the fourth number. Because this four apparently is going up by nothing, so there's going to be a four there. Which means the seven is going up by four. Hmm. They've changed their tune. They're convinced that they can do it. Hey, so, yes, of course. I knew the answer was yes. I knew it. It's okay. It's okay to be nervous. It's totally cool to be nervous. Because maths is a human enterprise. Be your fabulous human self. If you're nervous, be nervous. It's okay to have an emotional reaction. That's what it means to be a human being. Even in maths class, believe it or not, be human. Just take a deep breath and I bet we'll be able to do something. Thanks if Might you could have thrown out a, uh, a possible answer for that. I, don't, I actually have no idea what the answer is myself because I've made this up on the spot. So what, is, what are they saying? What sort of answers are we getting? A couple of, couple of answers are in the 60s. 65, in the 60s? 63. Oh, God, gee. Okay. We're a little bit over the place, but we're in the 60s apparently. Did I do that correctly? I'm going to make a mistake because I cannot do arithmetic for the life of me. Zero goes up by one. Four goes up by... One, uh, 11 goes up by five, 16. 23 goes up by 16, oh my golly gee, 29, 39. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, one goes up by three, that must be four. One goes up by four, that must be five. Five goes by five, must be 10. 10 goes, 16 goes by, must be uh, 26. Oh, 39 goes up by 26. That is 50, 15, which is known as 65, I believe, for most people. Is it 65? Is that one of the answers to the chat? Please say that I did my arithmetic correctly. 65. Yes, absolutely. 65 oh, so all my, over the chat. All over the place. Beautiful. But here's my point. As I said, all I need to give you is the front numbers, and you actually now know everything. But I'm going to call this the leading diagonal. So that it's the diagonal of all the leading numbers. To know your leading diagonal is to actually know the entire table. Not only did you work out the, the sixth place, you actually worked out everything. The leading diagonal tells all. Tells all. So if I know the leading diagonal, I actually know everything. So here's my job for right now. Let's get to know some very famous leading diagonals. So let me take some famous sequences and let's work out the leading diagonal. So here's my first famous sequence. It's not very exciting. It's the sequence called the one sequence because it's nothing but ones. One, 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 forever. So what's its leading diagonal? Well, I go, okay, this is a difference of zero, up by 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 zero. Up by zero. Let me keep going, because the zero to zero is up by zero. That's up by zero. That's also up by zero, by zero, zero. Oh, keep going. That's up by zero, up by zero, up by zero. Okay, pretty boring. But you can see the leading at angle is going to be ones and a whole bunch of zeros forevermore. All right, so the constant sequence is not very exciting. It's the leading at angle. It's just one, zero, 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 zero. There it is. Now, let me do this famous sequence of the counting numbers. I'll just say n, because the nth number in the sequence is the number n. The first number is one. The second number is two, the third number is three, the fourth number is four, fifth number is five, sixth number is six, seven, eight, and so on. 
what's the leading diagonal of that famous sequence? Okay, I'll do this up, goes up by one, 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 up by zero, 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 and then I'll be doing lots of zeros forevermore in my life. All right, so its leading diagonal is one, one, zero, 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 zero. Great, that's two of them. Uh, the square numbers, let's do that. The nth number is the nth square number. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared, six squared, and so on. Ooh, now this is getting a bit juicier. What's the leading diagonal of that famous sequence of square numbers? Up by three, up by five, up by seven, up by nine, up by 11. Up by two, up by two, up by two, up by two, and then I think I'm in zero world thereafter. Yes, lots of zeros. All right. Okay, one, three, two, zero, 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 zero. You want to do the end, the cube numbers? One cubed, two cubed, three cubed, uh, 27, four cubed, oh golly gee, uh, uh, 64, five cubed, 125, six cubed, 216. Do you want to do that one? Say no, please say no, please say no, please say no. I don't want to do that one. I don't want to do the arithmetic. Anyone want to do that one? Please say no. I'm not doing it. Truly, I'm not doing it. Can you see me not doing it? Oh, golly gee, that's uh, 75 plus 16 is 81. It's like 91 or something. I'm still not doing it. I'm not going to do it. Don't, you can't make me do it. I'm not doing it. No way am I doing it. James, every time you say you're not doing it, people are saying yes. I am doing it. Look, I did it. <laughs> Whoa, one, seven, 12, six, zero, zero, zero. Okay. The answer to the cube fourth numbers is no. I'm definitely not doing that one. You can do that one. Optional homework. Show me the leading angle of the fourth power numbers if you want. Okay. Okay. So why do I do this? What am I doing? Here's my theory. I have a theory about what to do if you believe in patterns. It's this. It goes as follows. Suppose I take a formula that's based on these basic sequences. Like if I did the sequence of, say, n squared plus n, that is the first number will be 1 squared plus 1. The second number will be 2 squared plus 2. The third number will be 3 squared plus 3. Then 4 squared plus 4. Then 5 squared plus 5. Uh, then 6 squared plus 6. 36 is 42. Um, 7 squared plus 7. Oh, I don't know. That's too hard for me. 7, 49, 50, 7, 56. That's good enough. All right, and so on. I am wondering, oh, come, come on camera, come on camera. Behave, behave, behave. I am wondering if I were to work out the leading diagonal of this sequence, which is basically n squared plus n's, if it's somehow connected to the leading diagonal of the n's and the leading diagonal of the n squareds. In fact, I want it in some sense, it really is n squared plus n, but I see it with the leading diagonals. So a little bit of a theory, so let, me, let me write it right here. I've got the n's, has a leading diagonal that was, uh, I'm copying it off this page here. N was one, one, zero, 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 zero forever. And N squared is, uh, was one, three, two, then zeros. One, three, two, then zero, zero, zero. So there's the basic leading diagonals. I am wondering if the leading diagonal of this one, whose formula I've made up, I could see it as a combination of those ones. So let me do it. Let me actually do this sequence. Uh, up by four, up by six, up by eight, up by 10, up by 12. Please up, up, by, up by 14, and yes it is. Up by two, 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 and then up by zeros thereafter. All right, so this has the leading diagonal two, four, two. Can anyone see any connection between two, four, two, then a bunch of zeros, and the basic ones I began with? If you stare at that for a while, I bet the answer is yes, because you can't help but notice, because I need a thin pen. If I look at the entries row by row, let me draw some, separate the first, second, thirds, fourths, fifths. You can't help but literally see one plus one is two, one plus three is four, zero plus two is two, zero plus zero is zero, and so on. That if I took this diagonal plus that diagonal, I actually get that diagonal if adding means add it along each row. So actually, I have a beautiful theory. If someone gives me a sequence and I don't know what the formula is, I don't know what the formula is first, if I could look at the leading diagonal, if I could recognize the leading diagonal as some combination of basic ones, then I have a potential formula for the sequence. 
And once I have a potential formula, I can actually just check it. Does it work for n equals one, n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, and so on. I love this. So let me show you how this works. Let me let's, let's do one. Um, let's try this one, this piece. I'll do this one on my own Z's, and then I'll ask you to do one on your own Z's next. One, six, 15, 28, 45, 66. I'm not gonna just ask what's the next number in the sequence. I'm gonna ask for way more. Give me an actual formula that fits that sequence. Now uh, well, that's a challenge. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm actually going to do the differences. This goes up by five, up by nine, up by 13, up by 17. Please be up by 21, is it? Yes, up by 21. Because I'm seeing four, 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 then zero, 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 zero. So there's the leading diagonal. So I've currently got the leading diagonal right now, one, five, four, zero, 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 forevermore. Oops, off the page. Now, I did write a little cheat sheet for myself of what the basic ones were we just did. So let me copy those here. I'm wondering, is this a combination of ones, one, zero, 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 and n squareds, one, one, zero, 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 and n cubes, Sorry, it's uh, n's and n squares. In, in, sorry, n squares are here. And the n cubes. Now we need the n cubes, sorry. 1, 7, 12, 6, 0, 0, so on. Okay, so that was the 1's, the n's, the n squares, and the n cubes. So I'm wondering now, can we possibly see 1, 5, 4 as a combination of those basic diagonals? Ugh. That's my emotional reaction right now. Ugh. Let me just draw the rows a line because my, my page technique is terrible. All right, so there we go. All right, you heard me go, ugh, this is horrible. No one in the right mind wants to do this. I don't actually want to do this. But then I say to myself, okay, take a deep breath, Tanton. I've acknowledged my human reaction. I can do something. First of all, I want to do my mathematician self. My mathematician self says, avoid hard work. Don't do hard work. Don't do hard work, Tanton. Can you work hard to avoid hard work? And the answer hopefully is yes, because look at this. I'm gonna go down to where all the zeros are. If I'm doing arithmetic, zero is a much easier number to work with than any other number in arithmetic. I know where the zeros are, because my life is easy with zeros. Look, this zero is actually a combination. Whatever I do, it's gonna be a combination of zeros. So this zero is fine. Great, I got that row to match up. Whatever I do there, it doesn't matter, it's gonna be zero. This is gonna be fine. This zero is gonna be a combination of zeros, it's gonna be zero, that's gonna work out. Look at this zero. Ooh. There's a six there. That tells me, Tanton, James, don't use that one. You don't want any sixes appearing. You don't need that. You don't want any n cubes. I've saved myself some work. So just use these zeros and life will be good. Aha, now you might be seeing how my brain's working because then I go to the four. Now I've got zero, zero, and two to play with. Oh, but I want four. I guess the only option is to have two n squareds because that will give me two twos, there's four, and what if I do next doesn't matter, it's all zero. Aha. Okay, go to the next row up, five. Right now I've got two of these, I've got two threes is six. Ooh, six, I don't want six, I want five. And all I've got to play with to get me to five is all oh, these numbers. I better do six, take away that one, I want negative one of those. Because that will give me two times three is six, take away one of these gives me five, I've now got it set up. And by the way, I have not ruined this one. Two times two is four. Take away one zero is still four. Great, I'm still good. Now, top line, so I've got one to go. Two of these is two times one is two. Take away one of these is one. Oh, I'm done. I don't need any of those. Get rid of that. Don't need it. So now I can see by doing two n squareds, take away an n, life might be okay. There is my potential formula. So let's check it, let's check it. Does it work for n equals one? Does it work for n equals one? Two times one squared minus one, two times two take away one is one, it works. For n equals two, two times four, eight minus two is six. Uh, let's go to the weird one, one, two, three, four, five, six. If it works for this one, I'm gonna believe it. Two times 36, six squared is 36. Two times 36 is 72, take away six. Ha 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 ha. What power? Now, we've not only just actually can say what the next number is, and in the, in the, if we believe in patterns, we've now got a way to find a formula for these sequences. I bet this is exactly what Galileo was doing. This is what Galileo was doing, in fact. On your own Z's, 
I would like you to please find for me a formula that fits this data. 15, 31, 53, 81, all on your own. So you might want that to help you out. And uh, you might want the camera to be in focus as well. That could be helpful. Go on camera, why am I having fussiness today? Great. Can you work out the leading diagonal and see the leading diagonal as a combination of these basic ones? Because that would be mighty grand. And if I'm making you work, I will work as well. I'll be, I'll be a nice guy. Okay, I think I've got the leading diagonal. Now the challenge is, write that leading diagonal, it's a combination of the basic ones. Okay. One, four, six, zero, zero, zero. Oh, I'm off the page. There we go. Ones. Ends. N squareds. N cubes. No, one seven, one seven, twelve, six. Ugh. I hope I don't use the N cubes, they're horrible. All right. That's our challenge. Oh, actually, I can see I don't need the N cubes. Thank goodness. I messed it up. Good thing, don't need it. And I can see I don't need it because if I used it, that six there would cause me troubles with that zero there. So get rid of that, none of those, none of those. So it's gonna involve ones, ends and n squareds at most. All right. If you're bold and brave, feel free to type into the chat. Nadi will help me out and see what people are saying. I actually don't know the answer because I haven't actually done it myself. Though I can see we're going to need three of these. Well, it's going to be three n squared. So that will then, I've got rid of that one. We'll now make that six work. Actually, I can see I need negative five of those. So that will now make that work and not ruin my six. So what's the final one? What's the final one? Three ones is three, take away five ones is negative two, and I want positive one, I guess I want three of these. I think the potential formula is three n squares, take away five n's plus three. And does that work? Does that work? Put an n equals one, I get one. Put an n equals two, I'll go to 12, take away 10 plus three is five, yes. Put an n equals three. 
Uh, 27, take away 15, plus three, that's 30, take away 15 is 15. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What power? If you believe in patterns, we now have a technique, because as soon as you start finding constant differences, you actually then actually work with a formula. All right, so we have 15 minutes and one second left together in our lives. So that was what to do if you believe in patterns. Here's reason why you shouldn't believe in patterns. I'm going to play this intelligent test again, and game again, and you're not going to like me this time. Two, four, six, eight. What's the next number of the sequence? Well, clearly the answer is 17. The answer is absolutely 17. And here's why I know I'm right. It's not two, four, six, eight, 10. It's actually two, four, six, eight, 17, because I was actually using this formula. Seven twenty-fourths and to the fourth power minus 35 twelfths and cubed plus 245 on 24 and squared, uh, minus 151 over 12 ants plus seven. Believe it or not, despite those horrible fractions that formula, if you put in n equals one, all those fractions work out and give you two. Put in n equals two, all these fractions work out and give you four. n equals three gives you six, n equals four gives you eight, and n equals five gives you 17. The next number in that sequence is 17. Actually, actually, I misspoke. No, 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 no. It's actually negative eight. The next number is negative eight. Because I wasn't using that formula, I changed my mind. I was using this formula. Negative 0 0.075 and to the fourth plus 7.5 n cubed minus 26.25 n squared plus 39.5 n minus 18. Put in n equals one, two, three, four, and five into this formula. And out comes, despite all the decimals, in turn, the numbers two, four, six, eight, negative eight. Crazy, crazy. I have to know there's no reason to believe in patterns a priori. If you've got logic behind where these patterns, these numbers are coming from, then you might want to believe in the patterns. You've got logical arguments you have to do. Because I know that we can actually create formulas to fit any set of data we like. So for the remaining 13 minutes together, I'm gonna to teach you how on earth I came up with those ridiculous formulas so I could put any number I liked at the end of this pattern. Two, four, six, eight, 42. I could write a formula for you. So could you. You could write a formula as well. Here goes. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm doing. Um, let me start off with a, a simpler version. Suppose I've got some data and I'll do it like a very schooly way. I'll draw an X, Y table. At X equals one, X equals two, and X equals three. I want the values 10, nine, and 13 in turn. Um, okay, why I chose those ones? Well, actually for a reason, because I'm about to write down a formula that actually spells my name, because the 10th letter in the alphabet is J. The ninth letter in the alphabet is I, and the 13th letter of the alphabet is M. Many people actually know me as Jim. So I'm about to write a formula that if you put in X equals one, out comes J. Put in X equals two, out comes I. Put in X equals three, out comes M. It'll be a formula that spells my name. Here goes. I'm doing this live. I'm not looking at any notes, but I've got some notes to my left. You see me dashing to the left. I'm not going to look at them. I'm going to write down a formula right now that fits that data, and it's going to look horrible. It's going to freak you out. It's going to be scary beyond belief. We'll have a deep breath, and you'll see that I'm actually not that clever. I'm not doing anything very clever. Here goes. Here's my formula that if you put in x equals 1, 2, and 3, out in turn would come 10, 9, and 13, and we want the camera to be in focus for this extraordinary event. Here's my formula. It's going to be 10 times x minus 2 times x minus 3, all over negative 1, negative 2, plus 9 times x minus 1, x minus 3, all over 1 times negative 1, plus 13 times x minus 1, x minus 2, times 2 over times 1. Bingo. I claim that messy, horrible formula, hopefully I did my arithmetic correctly, actually does the trick. When you put in x equals one into this beastly thing, out comes 10. When you put in x equals two into this beastly thing, out comes nine. When you put x equals three into this horrid thing, which is also beastly, out comes 13. So can you see why that's true at least? First, let's look at it. Let's, let's try x equals one first. Can you see what sneaky thing I did here? Well, obviously my formula comes in three chunks. There's one chunk, there's another chunk, there's a third chunk. In fact, I'm going to see one chunk seems to be associated with 10. Second chunk seems to be associated with 9. And the third chunk is associated with 13. Let's try actually putting in x equals 1. 
Well, if you look at this, two of these chunks disappear for x equals one. Because look what I secretly did. Here I've got an x minus one in a numerator. So if I put in x equals one, this becomes one minus one. This becomes zero, which makes the whole thing zero. When I put x equals, x equals one here, I've got x minus one in this numerator. So this becomes one minus one. That whole thing vanishes, it becomes zero. In fact, the only thing that survives when I put in x equals one is that first chunk. And look what happens if you actually put in x equals one. What do you get? You get 10 times. Now on the top line, you get one take away two. That's negative one and one take away three, that's negative two. So you get negative one times negative two on the top line. And look what I put on the bottom line. Exactly that, negative one times negative two. So what you get there is a two on the top, two on the bottom, the whole thing becomes one, 10 times one is 10. So I put in x equals one, I actually get 10 plus zero plus zero, which is 10. Beautiful. In fact, let's try another one. I'm making a real mess here, but let's try putting in x equals three. I'll do this in green. I've designed it so only one chunk survives. So I put in x equals three. In fact, you can see right now, because of that factor I put in at the top there, that goes to zero for x equals three. That goes to zero for x equals three. Because I put three minus three, there would be zero. The only chunk that survives for x equals three is that third chunk. If I actually put in x equals three, I'll get 13 times three minus one, two on the top, three minus two, one on the top. And lo and behold, look what I put in the bottom, two and one to completely counteract that. 13 times one, 13 times one is 13. So put in x equals zero, I get, so x equals three, I get a zero plus a zero plus a 13, I get 13. In fact, you can see that the only chunk that survives to x equals two is this chunk. And then you bet I made my numerator actually balance my denominator when x actually is two. So I'll get zero plus nine times one plus zero, I'll get nine. There is a formula that spells my name. I love it. In fact, I call this my personal polynomial. My personal polynomial. Um, but let me make this sort of more clear. Let's, let's do another example. Because in the curriculum, at least in the US, and I don't know what the story is in Australia right now, we often have kids say, please write a quadratic that fits this data. And they'll give something like, when x is 2, I want 5, please. And when x is 7, I want 97, please. And when x is 104, I would like um, 97 and a quarter, please. Which is ridiculous. No one does that in the curriculum. But I bet we could do the same work. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'll do exactly the same thing. Despite the numbers, I'm gonna write down a formula right now. My first chunk wants to deal with this five. So I want five to come up to my first chunk. And I want my first chunk to disappear for seven and 104, which means I'm gonna put X minus seven and X minus 104 in the top of that first chunk. Because when X is seven, it will go away. When X is four, 104, it will go away. This will only survive for x equals two. And when x equals two, oh, let me create a denominator that will counteract putting x equals two. I want a negative five there, I want a negative 102 there. Beautiful, done. That chunk will disappear for 704, it will survive for two, and when I do put in x equals two, I'll get five times one, I will get five. Is it starting to click a little bit now? This is loads of fun. Uh, for the second chunk, 97. I want it to vanish for two and 104. So let me do, make that vanish for two and 104. And I want it to actually survive for seven. Also, when I put in seven, I'll get five and seven. I'll count three, why did I do this myself? And negative 97. That would do it, because I want to actually put in x equals seven, I'll get five and negative 97 on the top, which is exactly what I just put on the bottom, just in that very moment. You watch me do it. This chunk will disappear for every number two and 104, but survive for seven. And when I put in x equals seven, I'll get 97 times one, I'll get 97. And finally, it doesn't matter what my data values are, 97 and a quarter is ridiculous, but I want to disappear for two and disappear for seven. And therefore I want to counteract when I actually put in 104, I need 102 here and I need a, a 97 there. If I'm doing my arithmetic correctly. There is a formula that actually presents that data. You've got to love this, this is amazing. And when I was teaching high school, they often had exam questions, write down a quadratic that fits this data. And the question stopped there. They never asked you to do anything with the quadratic. Therefore, you do not need to do anything with this formula. This is valid, absolutely valid. In fact, can you see it is quadratic? I'll see if I actually had the patience to expand this out. There'll be an X squared term there with some horrible fractional stuff. There'll be an X squared term there with some horrible fractional stuff. There'll be an X squared term there with horrible fractional stuff. It's a whole bunch of X squareds and a whole bunch of Xs and numbers. This is quadratic, done. Question solved. But here's the thing. You don't actually have to stop with degree two. 
because my actual name, as you know, is James. Uh, X, Y, I'll do X equals one, two, three, four, five. The data that spells my name would be 10 for J, one for A, 13 for M, uh, five for E, 19 for S. And I actually wrote down the polynomial that actually spells my name by doing exactly the same work. And then I actually did all the expansion work. Here's the formula that spells my personal polynomial. It is 83 24 X to the fourth minus 497 twelfths X cubed plus 4,141 24 X squared minus three, six, uh, three, four, six, three on 12 X's plus 164. It's insane. It's totally insane. And what actually freaks me out about this is that despite these horrible fractions, magically put in one, two, three, four, and five, out come these whole numbers for J, A, M, E, S. Whoa, whoa. I have four minutes left. I, have to, I, I didn't plan on doing this, but I'm gonna do it right now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. You're about to see my entire, my entire laptop, my entire desktop, this would be dangerous. Let me get, knock out a Zoom for a moment. Because if you type in personal polynomial into Google, you will find something amazing. Let me just do it right now. You're not you're having not you're having none non fun watching me do this. Okay, here it is. I found it. So this is all part of the global math project. I think I can share my screen again. I'll come back to Zoom. I'll get the flight, flight person here. Share my screen. And do I see it in my screen? I'm doing the fumbly thing as people always do. Uh, let's share the whole screen. You're not going to like this because I'm going to get there. We go. I think you can see it now. All right. I had someone write for me a program that will actually do this for you. I'm going to type in my name, James, J-A-M-E-S. And look at this. It's actually drawn me a graph of the polynomial and actually shown me my own polynomial. There's the polynomial that spells my name. Whoa, and I'm going to do like 3D effect on this. So, Nadia, are you still with me? Is there someone in chat that would like me to type in their name? Whoever types into chat their name first, I will type it into the program. All right, James, All right. have a look. Yep. I'll reset, I'll change the background color. I go to my program's being, oh, how about that neon yellow? Well, it hurts my eyes. Who would like that person, no, that personal polynomial in lime green? Can you do mine while we're waiting? You bet, Nadia, here it comes. And then you'll have to do Amy because she was first. You bet, Nadia. You look like a, a, a lovely sort of S-shaped curve. You're actually aquatic. There is the, your personal polynomial, the one that spells your name. I love that. Wow. Thank you. There we go. And I'm just doing the same technique I was doing all along, which is that sort of technique. It's all going on in this program. And then was whoops. And then there's Amy, uh, reset, and background color. I choose. That's true. A rustic red for Amy. A M Y. I assume. Amy, you're looking very linear. Look at that. You have a perfect straight line for your name. You are just 12x minus 11. That is beautiful. That's glorious. Look at you. Whoa, going off to infinity forever. Well done. Well done. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now. But if you go to the globalmathproject.org, you will actually find everything about polynomials and everything about these patterns I've been doing. So I went through very fast today. So go look at our page, poke around, and look at our all U-shaped graphs quadratic. And when you do that, you'll find everything I did today. Plus, you'll also see on that page the personal polynomial app. So now you are in full control of data. You now know how to fit any formula to any set of data. You can actually freak out the world. Take the stock index of the last 12 months. You could write a formula that fits that perfectly and make people think that you know what's going to do next month. By the way, that would be called a scam. Don't do that. That's bad. It's also not true. But the fact is, you can make any pattern you like. If you've got a pattern and you want to say the next number is something crazy, you can justify that by writing a formula for it. So there we go. If you trust patterns, there's a way to get formulas for it. If you don't trust patterns, there's now a way to write formulas to make it anything you want it to be. What power, what joy, what, what control. Wow. That leaves us 40 seconds for questions. Anyone have a question that I should ask me in 40 seconds? <gasps> Well, while we're waiting for the delay, James, I'll just take a quick moment to thank you again for this amazing presentation. 
your energy and your enthusiasm um, is just incredible and all the people in the chat have really loved listening to you. I don't think any of the presenters have ever offered me my personal polynomial, so that's a first for me today. Excellent. You're so welcome. I'll just pop over and see what I can see in the chat. Um, People were quite amazed that Amy's polynomial was straight. Uh, Is that fabulous? Fun. Lots of thank yous. You're so welcome. It's my joy, my pleasure. And what uh, I love speaking to my homeland. So thank you for having me. This is a real, real, real joy. It was really interesting. Uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. But on the final note, you said, let's go and freak out the world. Let's take our love of maths out into the world. <laughs> uh, I think that's a great motto for these two days. Uh, what you were doing Brand. today was very cool, Jane. So um, I think we'll all take a lot away. Thank you Excellent. very much. And, and if there are any questions, just email me. I'm e very easy to find on email and I will answer. I might be slow because I get a lot of emails, like as I keep giving up, inviting people to email me, but I will, I will respond eventually. So yes. great. Thank you so much, everyone. A real pleasure. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Thanks so much Bye. again, James. On behalf of the MAV, it's been fabulous having you. To the delegates, we'll take a, uh, a quick break now. Don't forget to check out the uh, virtual delegate satchel and to go and have a chat with the exhibitors and the sponsors. And the next session in room three commences at 20 past 11. We'll see you then. Thanks, everyone.